The artist Agnes Martin once said, paintings are not about ideas or personal emotions. Paintings are about freedom from the cares of the world, freedom from worldliness. This is a very challenging statement in times like now, when we feel that everything has to be socially engaged in order to be meaningful. Today, I would like to use my own work in order to see through this. Eighteen years ago, I did something silly. I was working in a metal shop, and in one corner of the room, there was a little sandblaster. Suddenly, I had a strange idea. What would it be like to put a book in that sandblaster? I had a book with me, so I immediately went there, put the book inside, closed the door, started the machine, put my hands in the gloves, put the nozzle on the book, and bingo. Within seconds, the whole Biblios project unfolded. I saw the wind carving the dunes and cliffs. I saw civilizations being wiped out and recast into new ones. I saw culture returning to nature. Viewed from outside, this discovery seemed to make sense because of my personal life situation. I was 42, and I was going back to school because, let's face it, I was totally lost. After 20 years of artistic career, mainly as a music composer, that life had come to a stop. It was impossible to continue. One single question was responsible for this, and that question was, is imagination a sickness? That's quite a deadly question if you're involved in creating anything, I can tell you. In the West, we value imagination a great deal, but in other cultures, in Asia, for example, imagination is often seen as a hindrance to true happiness. Personally, at that time, that idea was very enticing because very often, after productions, I suffered severe crashes. So I came to think, what's the point? I could write one piece after the other, after the other, but what is it that I'm looking for? Is there a central issue in my work? Is there a central issue in life? Big questions. I ended up doing two master's degrees, one in anthropology and one in visual arts. I did both MAs simultaneously, mind you, because one was the fieldwork of the other. In anthropology, I studied my cohort in visual arts, this very strange tribe of artists, imagination junkies. In visual arts, I studied my cohort in anthropology, this other very strange tribe of academics, knowledge junkies. In anthropology, I wrote a thesis, 350-something pages, but it can be summed up in one line. There is no real justification to art outside the actual practice of art. Sounds simple, but we'll see in a moment that it's not that simple. In visual arts, the Biblios project was very productive. Beside the important creation of artifacts, I wrote the story of the Biblios, this ancient culture of people who lived in books. The Biblios literally excavated books in order to connect words with one another. Eventually, they dug too many tunnels and they finally perished under the weight of their knowledge. After the Biblios project, many other projects emerged for example, the, um, the Great Wall. In the 23rd century, 
the Great Wall of America collapses and China invades America. In American libraries, some Chinese soldiers find books that were banned in their own country, and this is the beginning of the end for the Chinese Empire. So that was it. I was back on track. My crisis was over. I had found the perfect medium to express my lifelong concerns. My love-hate relationship with intellectual knowledge, my critique of the ideologies of progress, and the idea that true knowledge could very well be an erosion instead of an accumulation. So far, so good? Sure? Are you sure? Well, I'm not sure. I think there's a trap here. Here's a trap. Am I implying that this is what art is about? Saying things? Am I suggesting that art is a kind of language and that artists use that language in order to communicate things to you, the viewers? Remember the saying, if you only have a hammer, then everything starts looking like a nail? Well, maybe there's a problem here. And maybe anthropologists, anthropology can help. Anthropologist Jacques Maquet, for example, argues that in the West, we rely mostly on two regions of consciousness, or two modalities of consciousness. Cognition and emotion. We forgot almost completely about the third region, which he calls contemplation. And so we are caught, caught in, into a two-sided world. When we have too many ideas, we go get some emotions. When we're fed up with emotions, we run back to ideas. And of course, we expect, we expect art to fit in that swing. We forgot that there could be at least a third option, neither cognition nor emotion. Of course, we have glimpses of contemplation through aesthetic experiences, for example. But we don't fully realize the scope of these experiences. We don't see the selflessness in them. Jacques Maquet's framework is a very nice theory. I still use it today. But once you've explained things, especially if you're an artist, then what? When I finished school, I thought that, for me, it was a victory of art over anthropology. I was leaving the world of ideas and going back to the world of feelings and intuition. That's what I thought. But looking back, maybe it was the opposite. What if school just spoiled me? What if I've actually been colonized by this new academism in art, art as idea? You see, for a long time after school, I was still trying to use my anthropology to do art. I started feeling that there was something wrong in this when I realized that all my texts, you remember the story of the Biblios, the Great Wall? All these texts were written afterwards, once the sculpture were done. In the actual making of the pieces, I was not trying to illustrate any story or theory. I was just doing the pieces. In other words, the text did not produce art. Art produced the text. As much as I wanted the pieces to be socially relevant, as much as I wanted to use them to make strong social statements, the pieces would not allow me to do that. And if I insisted, the well of inspiration would dry up. So, 
going back to that very first sandblasting moment, did I really see all those things? The ancient worlds, the decline of civilizations, even the collapse of our own, of our own culture? Maybe I just saw a landscape. Do landscape actually say things? How can I know? Well, I can do what anthropologists do in that case. I can go back to the field. So let's do that. Actually, let's start by the end. I come out of the studio after a full day of work. I open the door and start walking on the sidewalk. Things shine strangely. The colors of buildings seem abnormally vivid, harmonious. Looking at trees, I feel new relations between the branches, as if I suddenly understood some secret code. Freshness is the word that comes to mind. The world is fresh. Obviously, the aliveness of the spectacle has something to do with me. So what happened in those seven hours of studio work? What is that freshness? Let's go back inside. When I carve a mountain, I become the mountain. And I'm not saying this as a metaphor, I'm saying this literally. While carving, I have to feel the rocks falling from the mountain top. I have to feel the process of erosion. In fact, this is not something that I have to do, it comes naturally. I feel the rocks falling. I know where they fall and where they accumulate. Then I feel the rain eroding the cliffs. I am the stream running down the hills and creating new landscapes. I can feel the pull of gravity and the obstacles on my way. Then, at some point, everything shifts. Something takes over. It all becomes abstract. Relationship between lines, shapes, colors. And, all of a sudden, there are two hands in the picture. Very busy, apparently doing the only thing that could be done at that moment. It is only then that I realize that the work swallowed everything. Concerns about the value of what is being done, the career, the fight for survival, trying to impress or seduce others. All this is gone. They're still thinking, but very far in the background. There's not even emotions. There is a kind of joy, kind of. But that joy is not ecstatic. It's just a very quiet openness. the freshness. This is why I think that the dominant feeling in that freshness is what I call no outside. That freshness has no outside. It's not about something else. When you're in that freshness, there's nothing that lies behind things. Nothing is hidden. Everything is as it is perfect in a way. And this, this is what contemplation is about. The distance between the observer and the observed, that distance disappears. So, 
going back to the beginning. What's the meaning of art? Where does it come from? How can it help improve the world? Well, after so many years of trying to find answers to these questions, I came to think that maybe these are not the right questions, because they are questions from outside. Maybe at some level, there's no outside to things. Maybe things are just the way they are, and for no reasons. Maybe there's an infinite joy in realizing that things don't have to be a means to an end. They don't have to be useful, they don't have to have a purpose, a function. I think this is something you discover when you do art. And I think this is one thing, maybe, that artists can really bring to the world. No outside. In the end, Maybe this is what we mean when we use words like beautiful. Thank you. Wow, it was very in-depth. So this is such a profound idea that you have that um, you know, the purpose of art doesn't come from anywhere other than the art itself. Mm -hmm. And perhaps artists would be better off for thinking that way. Do you think that this is a more sustainable artistic approach? Well, sustainable, I mean, this is a sort of password that we use in many occasions now. I don't know if there is any, anything sustainable in art or for artists. It's so precarious. But one thing is sure, I would, I would invite artists to stop bringing their own agenda and trying to placating or importing these agendas on their work and let the work emer emerge from itself, from not knowing, I think. Thank you.